Lion's Sight, Services for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Graphic of a Lion's Head in Black and White on a Gray Background. And now you are looking at my kitchen table, okay, and I'm going to adjust the camera a little bit. We're going to be kind of like panning back and forth. So for starters, I'm going to show you some of my supplies. I use Type Bond. Now I use Type Bond glue because this is pulp. Um, and this is very useful stuff. For starters, it's waterproof. Uh, I don't know if I can get that in focus here. Let me see if I can get that. There you go. Your Type Bond glue is going to be waterproof. And this stuff is great. For starters, if your kid is visually impaired, they're automatically going to be a tactile learner and auditory learner, dual media. This is what we're always talking about in special ed with Professor Ting. She's another person you'll meet if you go to SF State. So because this stuff is waterproof, it's friendly to being touched and it makes the paper more resilient. Now this right here is just a demo copy that I made that uh, is kind of a cheapo one that I made to, to sort of show you how I template things out. So on the back end, I've got this line right here and this line is the middle of this piece of chipboard. I'm gonna show you some chipboard. Here's a scrap piece. Um, and uh, here's a fresh piece of chipboard. So chipboard you can buy in bulk from Amazon, comes in sets of like 500 sheets for I think 10 bucks. Uh, so it's pretty cheap, it's like a nickel a sheet or something like that. Um, as you can see, it's kind of thin, but it's thicker than paper, but it warps a lot. It's gonna come in the package warped, okay? So you gotta understand that this is basically just pressed cardboard, it's pressed fiberboard. Um, and so to help with the binding process, you're going to use this type bond or Elmer's. You don't want to use Gorilla Glue because Gorilla Glue, the um, binding agent that's in the Gorilla Glue version of the wood glue is too thick and it's going to come out splotchy and uneven. Next, what you do is, you know, I got my paint cup and my junk brush. This is my $1 dollar store Ace Hardware junk brush. Um, I mix some water in here and then I got my little paint palette. It's a Lenardi's coffee almond fudge topper lid and uh, I, what I do is I scoop out some of this type bond into here and then I pour a little bit of water from the cup into here. I mix it up with the brush. I clean the brush off into the cup because you want to get the excess water out and the excess would pulp out and you just want to be working with what's on the palette. This is a scanned photocopy and what I do is I scan the, the page because if I mess up the page I want to have a scan copy so I can reprint the scan instead of having to photocopy it. And also when you scan the resolution is higher whereas a photocopy isn't as high resolution. So you want to use a high quality copy. Now you might sit there and say, well, my kid's totally blind. Why do I want to bother with doing this? Well, the reason is because if, when your kid is doing a literacy activity, they're probably doing it in circle time. If they're doing it in circle time, there's going to be other kids in the classroom around them. And what you want to do is you want to make your kid the most socially attractive kid in the room. So even though they're blind and they've got a visual deficit and probably some learning delays because of it, because a lot of learning is incidental learning. Kids who are blind, they miss out on a lot of things early on. You want to give this kid the best opportunity they have to integrate with the rest of the classroom. So you need to give them visually compelling materials. This one I did in black and white because I didn't want to waste all my ink, but I want to show you when I did the actual book itself, it's in color. So I don't, I don't fool around when I'm doing the actual final copy, but for this demo, I just did it quick and dirty. This is slap chop because we're doing a demo, but the real one, you want it in color and you want to scan it so it's high resolution. What I do is I draw a line down the middle of the page using my set of rulers and then this sticky note, the edge of this, inside edge of this sticky note lines up with the middle of the page. I don't have to mark anything on the surface of this. I don't want to mark the surface of this at all. For starters, when this actually has ink on it, it's very likely to run. And you want to preserve this page as long as you can. Part of using the wood glue is it makes it more resilient to peeling. 
and uh, it makes the page stick better. It also hardens the chipboard and makes it more resilient. So when the kid touches the corner, when they're touching it, when they're exploring it, it holds together better. So now you got to figure out how to template things. And I'm going to kind of show you how that goes. This is a setup template. So this is going to kind of show you what the end product will look like. So what you do is you get, for starters, a blank sheet of Braille paper, right? And then you have to figure out what the middle size of the uh, Braille sheet is. I uh, don't have the initial template that I made, but I have what I call my window pane. I'm going to show you how I do it. And uh, this is kind of how I hacked things, and this is going to be really useful to you. So you make a window pane by figuring out how wide across your page is. Remember, you've bound it to chipboard. So the great thing is now that your uh, picture from your book is bound to the chipboard, it's got a bit of a hard edge to it, so it's easy to... Um, trace the outline of it, which is exactly what we did here. So I've got these dog ears on top. You fold a little bit of corner on the tape on either side so you get your nice little dog ear. You use, uh, I, well, what I use is the uh, more expensive uh, frog tape because it peels better. Remember, you're going to be peeling the window pane off of the actual sheet that the braille is going to mount onto. You want both pages to stay intact. Um, again, you're buying materials that are going to last I know that it may seem more expensive to buy the frog tape. It's like $5 extra for the roll of frog tape instead of the regular beige painter's tape. But this stuff peels better and it won't rip your paper. You also want to preserve this template because you're going to use this over and over again. So this is your window pane. And if you look at the window pane, the lines here that I've measured out here and here on the side line up with the center of it. So when I slide it in, it's going to be dead center. And what do you know, the edge of the sticky note, that sticky note that lines up with the line on the back of the chipboard, lines up perfectly here. That's how I know this is pretty much dead center. Okay? And because I know this is dead center, it's going to work. So now, what I do is I mount this page to this paper underneath. And now I've got this nice little space down here, and this is where I'm going to put my braille. And I'm going to make the braille fit the width of the page because I want the student to have a context that the braille goes across the page and where the book ends is where the braille ends. I want the book experience that the student has, the blind student, to simulate the book experience that a sighted student would have. Now I understand that that presents some limitations obviously because I'm only brailing in this limited area and braille takes up more space. But that's okay because I'm willing to put in those extra pages in the back. What I want to do is I want to create a context of what the book looks like in real life to a sighted person versus the perception that's in the mind of the student. Because the student who's blind has to kind of create a mental image of what the book looks like. And, you know, I'm not knocking their ability to mentally perceive it, but what a student perceives in their mind versus the reality is different. So the more context I can give them that links them and grounds their experience to the reality of touching the book, having their hands on it, and experiencing the book in a similar manner that a sighted student would, the closer their experience is going to be to that of their peers. Okay, the other reason that you want to put the braille in the context of the page, so you can see how I cut this out right here, and then I attach this to the sheet. Um, it also kind of gives context to the sighted student of what Braille is like. So here's a sheet right here that I sliced out up on top, another and another. So there's four sections right here, and these are four different paragraphs. And um, yeah, so this is the aquarium's fact page. This page is in black and white because in the book itself, it's actually black and white. So again, I, I copy what's in the book. So the uh, this top piece right here, which is in English, is what I've transcribed. I have not put Spanish translations of Braille. We're only working in English Braille right now. So this top section right here, you've got the Aquarium Fun Facts, 
courtesy of blah, 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 president and CEO of Mystic Aquarium, blah, blah, blah. That's all right here. These bullet points are not on this page. Those bullet points begin on the next page. And that's useful because for the sighted student, they're gonna look at it, that right there, that symbol is the indicator for a bullet point. So there's bullet one, two, three, and four. And so the formatting actually lends itself well because you can experience the four bullet points. You can trace your finger down to count one, two, three, four, and then there's no more here at the bottom. You can experience the, the, the tactile experience of moving your hand across the page. And then the sighted student also gets context for what Braille is like. I imagine that my student is gonna sit down with this in their hands and their sighted peer is going to sit next to them and the sighted peer is going to read a page and then the blind student is going to read a page and they are going to share in this book reading back and forth to each other and the sighted student is going to be incentivized to do it because the braille book includes visual representations of the actual book and that is going to help the blind student integrate more positively in a social, pro-social environment with their typically sighted peers. And it's gonna to demonstrate to the typically sighted peer that this other student who's a little bit different is a lot more alike than they thought. That's the whole purpose of this process. All right, so getting back to the templating. We got the template. We know where everything's gonna fit. I've explained the justification, okay. Here's an actual page that's mounted, right? So this is where the braille goes. You get all of that. This is another cheap black and white copy. This corner here is really useful for the student kind of feeling out the edge and understanding how big the page is. You get that, you get that. Okay, how do I actually make sure that the brailing fits this limited space, right? Because if I braille across the page, it's not gonna fit here when I wanna cut it out. That's where the next phase of the templating goes. This piece of paper has a margin that's set up to accommodate for that. So when you type in your Perkins, it's gonna go left to right. This is the 11 and a half side. This is the 11 inch side. So this line right here indicates to me as I'm typing left to right where to stop. And this line right here fits perfectly from the corner of the page right about there. See how those line up? So again, it's about lining everything up in advance and setting it up. So how do you do that quickly? I'm about to show you. Lion Sight. Regular updates on blind and visually impaired tutorials will be available for all kinds of topics. Thanks for watching.